So um, thank you all for coming this evening and for your practice. And um, Sensei spoke last week, um, continued discussion about the identity of relative and absolute. And the lines he was um, working with last week were uh, <clears throat> grasping the great reality, reading words, you may grasp the great reality. Um, do not judge by any standards. And he spoke about words and how they can both point the way and get in the way. Right? So I thought I would share a little bit tonight about how they get in the way for me and how I've been practicing um, with that. So this is, this is an interesting dilemma and challenge. My practice has been to say less, to speak less, as part of um, rewiring some of my habit patterns, particularly around language. And um, so this, I laughed when Sensei asked me to speak tonight and said, okay, fine. <laughs> um, somewhere between my inside and my outside when I speak, um, not always, but sometimes it gets scrambled. And I'm guessing others have that experience. Um, it feels like the words get in the way, like I'm saying too much. I call it a word salad sometimes. Um, or I go on or I go on tangents or um, I repeat myself. I can feel it when it's happening. I can feel the disconnection happening in the room. Whatever circumstances I may be, I can feel it inside myself, right? My mouth is moving, but nobody's there. So for a while now I've been exploring, well, why is that? What is it that's happening? What's that disconnect? And I learned recently that actually over explaining or over verbalizing um, can be a response to, um, to a lot of different things, but it can be a response to trauma, which I've definitely experienced in my life. Um, it can be a response to not feeling seen or heard. Um, so attempting to make sure that other people hear what I have to say. Um, certainly a response to just feeling anxious. So I go out of my body and up into my head and into my ideas where, um, where it often also feels safer. So um, I don't have to necessarily feel my own uncertainty or my vulnerability or my confusion. Yeah. It can also be a, a protective device um, if I can seem smart or that I have the answers, then, then I feel like I'm gonna be okay. And I can notice it happening even now, like, shit, <laughs> yikes. How do I do this and not do that? So you're getting to see a very live experiment right mm -hmm. now. Uh, many of you know that my mother passed away recently. Um, and in putting together this talk, I, I really saw a lot of where those habit patterns come from, that my mother and I spent a lifetime jading each other. And jading is an acronym for justify, argue, defend, and explain. And my family was a family made of jade. It always, somebody was justifying, arguing, defending, or explaining. My go-to was explaining, because I figured if I could explain it enough, then others would understand me and we would come to some agreement. Um, her jading was arguing, defending, and, and then I would go into justifying. And, um, and when I learned this acronym, while she was alive, uh, the number one suggestion that is given when you notice that you're jading with someone is to just stop, <laughs> just stop. Whatever you're doing, just stop, drop the rope. Um, it doesn't ever go anywhere. It doesn't, it's a, 
unresolving closed loop. And I also found it's a way of trying to control another person's reality, right? Again, if I can explain this in just the right way, then you will understand and agree with me and then I will feel okay, and I will feel safe. But really all it creates is just more tension and more confusion I found. So working with a teacher in Zen is a really interesting experience uh, because they can see you. <laughs> they can see you often more than you can see yourself. And Sensei, knowing this, gave me my Dharma name, which is Sokyo. So I realized I didn't give my name when I introduced and asked you all. So my Dharma name is Sokyo. So which is original and kyo in this case means mirror. So my Dharma name means original mirror. And the original mirror as, as I understand it uh, receives and reflects everything without distortion, with nothing getting in the way. So sensei saw that clarity in me, often a Dharma name is something that you see in someone but it's also something that they may aspire to. So he saw that in me, just as he sees that in everyone, right? He sees the clarity that's there, but he also saw all the stuff that was getting in the way. So he gave me this name and I aspire to see as clearly as the original mirror, to really embody that. Um, one of the other practices in, in Zen practice, Myoshin has it tonight, is to train to serve as Jikido. And um, Jikido is the timekeeper, keeps an eye on the time, rings the bells. And when I was first training in that service position, um, I realized that the sound of the bell perfectly revealed my state of mind. The, the tone, the resonance, the lack of resonance, the clanging, right? Um, if I was distracted or self-conscious about my ringing, sure enough, it would clang off a little bit. If I wasn't thinking about how I was gonna ring the bell and I just rang the bell, then it would ring perfectly clear, okay? So when I first started practicing, you ring three bells to start the period, and sometimes that first bell, because I wouldn't really be too caught up in how I was ringing it. I would ring it nice and clear and true. And then I would think, oh, that was nice. That rang really beautifully. And then sure enough, the second bell was like, clang. <laughs> and then the third bell was usually really timid because <laughs> I was afraid of what, was, what I was going to do. <laughs> And I, I had that pattern for weeks and months. Um, and I imagined Sensei wincing every time <laughs> and knowing that it, the, the bell was revealing um, the gap in me, right? I felt pretty naked and exposed. I have a pretty high performance anxiety, which also shows up in over speaking. And so the same thing with the bell every time before the time would come, I would just feel that jolt of adrenaline and my heart beating, it's just ringing a bell, right? You'd think it's no big deal. The Jikido is just up there ringing it. How many of you who have served a Jikido know exactly what I'm talking about? Right? I'm watching the clock and thinking, oh God, I have to ring it. Everybody's gonna hear me. And sure enough, clang. But sometimes I would strike the bell and it would ring just beautifully. And the bells at the end of the sitting period were always more clear and resonant than at the beginning. Certainly my technique didn't improve in 30 minutes. The striker, the bell, my arm, they were all the same. But what was the different? Right? As long as there was a person striking the bell, that person would get in the way. As long as I was attached to making sure that the bell rang clearly, it wouldn't. So my practice became 
just ring the bell. There's that word again, just. Not that just keep going, just ring the bell. I'm just a ringer that rings, a striker that strikes. No self, no separation, no problem. Bong, just ring. Simple, but not easy. So my experience, I see that our original nature is this, no gaps, no distortion, nothing getting in the way, pure and clear and intimate. And as humans, we have a really hard time living this way. And I definitely have a hard time speaking in this way. There's something that's happening in that whole process that really starts to muck it all up. And the more I try to think my way into clear speaking, the more stiff and garbled it gets. And I can feel it. Slowing everything down helps. Allowing myself to stay in my body instead of rushing ahead. But there are times where, I mean, I'm just off. Times when I've shared in this Sangha and I can feel it, how disconnected I am. And, and that performance anxiety afterwards, I would feel shame. Sometimes I would leave here and think, I'm just, I'm never going to share again just going to listen. And sure enough, the next time something would come up and like, no, but I have to share this thing and I want to really share it. And I really want people to hear it. And sure enough, I would do it again. And the danger becomes being so self-conscious that we don't speak at all. And that's not the point. That's not the practice. This is where the practice comes in. I started to see that the words were not the problem, right? Speaking itself is not the issue. The words are not getting in the way. It's me, I'm getting in the way. So I've been experimenting with this disconnect, saying less, saying nothing at all sometimes, but not necessarily restricting myself, but just seeing what happens in my body, noticing, the pull, noticing the clinging, the attachment to want to say something. Feeling in to see if my body wanted to say something, not my head. Noticing the difference in how that feels and then allowing that to speak like feeling the words into being. And so with this practice, also I noticed I just stayed more connected. My mind stayed calmer. And when my mind is still and clear and I'm intimately present with what's happening, not just here, but here and here, then the words come from my body and from my heart and not from my ideas and my conditioning. Gakyo shared recently on social media, um, some writing by Shoto Harada Roshi, who I really like, he's a Rinzai teacher. And he uh, often writes about this original mirror or original mind. And in this particular piece, there's, there's a segment that says, a mirror-like mind is a mind where there is no separation between a self and another. It is a warm, receptive mind. Like a mirror, it has no sense of a small self. When our mind is like a mirror, we can express ourselves with clarity and with simplicity. I can feel it. The words have a thickness, a tone. Simple, but they ring like a bell. So this is my practice and I invite you to join me. Can we speak as clearly as a bell, as a bird, as a stream?
What would that be like? As I was putting this together, a question came up for me. What were my mother's last words? She passed uh, late June. And I realized I didn't know. It, it was such a chaotic time. I actually didn't pay attention to what her actual last words were. I was very aware when she stopped being able to communicate. And it was a home hospice. I was there 24 hours a day with her. So it was interesting to see that active process of dying and when the body starts to really change and her, her systems were starting to shut down and speaking was one of them. And after a lifetime of jading with me, about four days before she died, um, she was mostly sedated. She really wasn't able to communicate at that point. And up until then, um, even though her body was giving out, she had um, <laughs> this actually rather terrifying um, insistence that she get out of bed and use the bedside commode when she needed to, to go to the bathroom. Even She couldn't even stand at this point, but she would start to get herself out of bed and we had to be really vigilant. She, and I had the way to, hoist her up she would put her arms kind of around me and I would lift her up and we would shuffle to the commode and she would go and come back and every you know the last few days of that it was like um, we had set her up with adult briefs and a, and a bed pad and everything and tried to convince her that she could go but she would insist to get out of bed but on this day it was clear she didn't have the strength she couldn't even move her legs really um, Her torso was too weak. Her eyes were fully opaque at that point. Um, and she was opening her mouth and saying something. She was saying, it's like, and I leaned in closer. What, I can't, I can't hear what you're saying. I'm so sorry, Mom. I, I cannot hear what you're saying. I can't understand you. And I leaned in again, and she, she said, I can't understand you. And then she bellowed, Yes! Yes! <laughs> She wanted to piss. <laughs> she, as clear as a bell, <laughs> for sure. Um, she was too fragile for me to lift her then. It would have been harmful. Um, so I, I couldn't. And I told her, I said, I'm so sorry. You can't, you're going to have to go in the bed. I'm so sorry. And um, the nurse was there with me and she's like, no. And I said, you're just gonna have to go in the bed, I know. And this is a woman who um, had controlled everything in her life and who was obsessively um, clean and uh, you know, nothing out of place. So we reassured her over and over and I started to cry. And I said, I'm so sorry. And she let loose just this gut wrenching. And the warm smell of urine filled the room. And she relaxed back onto the bed. And the nurse and I helped to change her immediately and clean her. And that was the last word that she ever said. 48 hours later, she died.
She had passed her koan. She finally let go. I turned off the oxygen machine that had been grinding away day and night for two months. And I held her hand in, a, in mine for a long time. Her face was smooth and relaxed, the ceiling fan above softly whirring. Just the thinnest layer of tissue over her bone, nothing in between. So how do we live and speak authentically? The way is not always clear, even as we walk on it. This is our practice. This is the mind of Zazen. The truth of who we are is always right here. And the quieter that I am, the more I can see it. And the less that I say, the more I can speak it. In our discussion, I look forward to hearing, how do you see it? Thank you.